Welcome everybody, good to see you. I hope you had a good last session. And uh, we're going to be thinking a little bit about ourselves uh, in this session. But before we do that, I, I want to ask you a question. How many people here have heard of a guy called Billy Graham? People heard of Billy Graham? So, so a lot of you. Uh, how many of you have heard of a guy called Chuck Templeton? Anyone heard of Chuck Templeton? Maybe a Ray Graham? Or Bron Clifford? Has anyone heard of Bron Clifford? Of course, there's always a chance I'm just making up these names entirely, isn't there? But, uh, but I'm not. The interesting thing is in the 1940s, these three guys, Billy Graham, Chuck Templeton and Bron Clifford, had kind of come out of the starting blocks and, and they were billed to be the, probably the world's greatest evangelists. They, they were filling stadiums, they were filling halls, they were doing amazing things. In fact, in the 1946, the National Association of Association of Evangelicals published one of those dangerous articles where they listed what they thought were the, 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 the men who were being used by God the most. And uh, Billy Graham didn't even get a mention. Chuck Templeton did, and Bron Clifford did. And yet, within five years of that article going out, uh, Chuck Templeton had completely given up his faith, left the whole ministry, just didn't believe it at all. And very sadly, Clifford went on to lose his family, his health, his ministry, battled with alcoholism, and at the age of 35, he died. Billy Graham goes on and is still alive today, just about, and has led millions and millions of people to Jesus all over the world. But the question is this, like, how did that happen? How did these three guys who were doing so well and doing some amazing things for the Lord, you know, in, in America, how did they end up, like, burning up and blowing out and getting it all wrong? How did that happen? And, and more importantly, perhaps, how do we make sure that doesn't happen to us, uh, that we are able to keep on keeping on? Um, Second Timothy in the New Testament is the last letter that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. And uh, it's the letter that he writes in a prison cell in Rome. He knows his numbers up. He knows that that mad Emperor Nero, if you've done history, that crazy Emperor Nero is going to have him killed. And, and tradition tells us that maybe even two or three months after Second Timothy is written, uh, Paul indeed did have his head cut off. So he writes to his friend, uh, Timothy. He's now an old man. And uh, he writes these words in Second Timothy 4, verse 7 to 8. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearance. Paul basically saying, you know what, I have finished well. You know, I, I've finished well. I've, I've done it. I'm about to die. I'm about to face God. But I do so with a smile on my face. I've finished well. I used to have a guy who was a spiritual director for me called Alex Buchanan. He is now with the Lord. He finished very, very well. And, uh, and Alex had this mantra for life where he said, I want to enter heaven breathlessly. He had this whole thing, like, I want to break the tape. I don't want to crawl across the line and just about make it into heaven, but I want to enter heaven breathlessly with a big yes as he kind of stands before the Lord. I love that. I love the sentiment of that, and surely he did. So how do we do that? How do we enter heaven breathlessly? How do we make sure that the work we do for God doesn't kill the work of God in our own lives. And I want to share with you four things that I'm learning help in, in helping us keep on keeping on, enjoying life and faith and not just enduring it. And the first is this, that we need the right focus. We need the right focus. And when I talk about that, I, I really mean two things. Uh, the focus around our passion, the things that we kind of love and want to get involved with, and secondly, the focus in our gifting. And when you take the gifts and the talents that you know have been put in you, whether you're good at speaking up front or running games or administrating or, or doing music or, or caring for people or hospitality or, or any of those things, whatever your gifts and talents are, and you can use that stuff in the area of your passion, then you're going to feel alive. You're going to feel like, wow, I really feel like I'm making a difference. You know, I can, I can remember when I was 17 years old and Alan and Debbie from our church were launching this new outreach called Prime Time, which 29 years ago was a really cool name for youth ministry. I, it really was, trust me. And uh, although two years later, the BBC launched this new daytime show for senior citizens and they called it Prime Time, so we had to do a rebrand. But, uh, but at the time, it was a brilliant name. It was a, it was a great name. And I just felt flattered. You know, I, it wasn't that I felt like God had called me to youth ministry. I just felt really flattered. But four weeks in, God utterly broke my heart for young people. 
And, uh, and I thought then, you know, you know what, I'm going to give the rest of my life to coming alongside young people and cheering them on and helping them become all that God created them to be. And, uh, you know, I have the privilege of being the senior pastor of this church. Whether I'll do that for life, I don't know. I have the privilege of working for Urban Saints, this national youth organization. Whether I do that for life, I don't know. But I do know that for, until my dying day, I'll come alongside young people. And it, in fact, it even came back to me just, uh, just two weeks ago, I went to go and see Jesus Christ Superstar performed at, at the Priory School. And it was brilliant, it was amazing. But the whole thing I found incredibly moving to see these 40 or so young people who were beautiful and amazing and fantastic and unique and so precious. And right at the end, there's a scene where Jesus is on the cross and he dies and they all look at him and they're singing that, the famous song, you know, Jesus Christ Superstar, do you think you're who they say you are? And I, I wanted to jump up and go, yes, he is. He's flipping amazing. Like, he's what you really need. Jesus is everything you really need. He's what you're really searching for and you're what your heart longs for. And, Luckily, my house is only a five-minute walk, and so I walked home. And it's a good job I walked home, because if anyone had spoken to me, I would have burst into tears. I was so moved, my heart still breaking for this generation of young people and, and, and wanting to see them be amazing for God. And so, passion. What's the thing that gets you up in the morning? Whether it's youth and children's ministry, whatever it is that, that you think, like, you know, as long as I'm doing that stuff... And, and using the gifts that I've got. There was a book called Good to Great, a leadership book guy, a guy called Jim Collins, and he talked about the importance of getting the right people on the bus and in the right seat. And so the right seat's so important, isn't it? That like, if you hate administration, like you don't wanna do an admin job in your youth ministry. It will kill your soul. But if you're good with small groups, or you are good at making cakes, or you're good at telling stories, or whatever it is, if you, Bring your passion and your gifting together. Then you feel fully alive. And after all, that's what God wants. He wants you to be fully alive. This, this guy called Arrhenius, who was an early church father, he, he had this amazing line where he said, the glory of God is man fully alive. And the vision, and, and, uh, the vision of God is, well, the glory of God is man fully alive. I've got the rest of the quote, but that's, that's the essence of it. And what he was saying essentially was that when you are feeling fully alive, because your passion and gifting are flowing together, then you make God look good because you're doing what he created you to do. And so if we're going to keep on keeping on in ministry, the first thing we've got to do is that we've got to have the right focus on our passion and gifting. The second thing is that we need the right people in our lives. We're not supposed to uh, do this thing called following Jesus and faith by ourselves. And... Uh, you know, in my church, we don't anymore. We used to sing certain songs which would have lines like this. God, you're all I need. You're everything. We'd throw up our hands and we'd weep. We'd say, God, you're everything. You're all I need. And, and actually, what I realize is that's wrong. Now, before you call me a heretic, okay, you're like, oh, what the heck is he saying? I, I, I want to remind you of the very first thing in the Bible that is not good. Who can remember? It's in Genesis 2.18. No looking up. It's not good for man to be alone. That's right. Genesis 2, 18. They're in the garden. But like Adam isn't alone. He's with God, for goodness sake. They're walking in the cool of the day. They're eating pizza and chilling out. And the kind of, well, I like to think they're eating pizza because it's like Eden, isn't it? So there must be pizza in Eden. So they've got this amazing relationship. And yet God says, no, 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 no. It's not that Adam just needs a relationship with me. He needs someone like himself. And so God creates Eve, and the word that's used in the Hebrew is, is a helpmate, a helper. Now, that doesn't mean someone to darn his socks and do his ironing and cook his dinner. It meant someone who comes alongside Adam to help him become everything he was created to be. And Eve would to do that for Adam, Adam to do that for Eve, and that's the way it's supposed to work. And so, so right in the very kind of essence of creation, God has wired us. We need people who will come alongside us and help us become all that we were created to be and, and to thrive. We can't do this thing alone. And, uh, and if we are, then we're a bit mad because this is hard. Life is hard. Faith is hard. Um, go on Bible Gateway later. Uh, or at some point in the next week and put in the phrase one another and see how many times it comes up in the New Testament how we should be with one another you'll you'll find like in Galatians 6 verse 2 that we need to support one another or in Colossians 3 13 we need to forgive one another or 1 Thessalonians 5 11 we need to encourage one another or Hebrews 10 24 we need to inspire one another or John 13 34 to 35 we need to love one another and 
And then James, Jesus' own brother, takes it a bit further in James 5.16. And he says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you will be healed. So not only does he say we need to confess our sins to God, but actually we need safe friends that we can be really honest with and say, look, here's my junk. Here's, here's the stuff I struggle with. Here's my secret sins. Here are my addictions and my struggles. And to know that those people will love us, care for us, cheer us on, give us advice, pray for us, keep us accountable for change. We all need those kind of relationships. You don't do it with the whole church. But to find one or two people that really have our back, it can be painful, but it really is productive, and it's, the, it's a good thing to do. So, right focus, right people. Thirdly, right commitment. And by that, I mean making sure that we've got, essentially, we're living with the right gospel. When I was a teenager growing up, I used to go to these evangelistic meetings, and there'd be an evangelist at the front, and he'd tell us all about Jesus. And at the end, he would, he would always ask the question. Now, if you've been around the block a while in the Christian scene, you'd have heard this question, because it basically goes like this. If you were to leave this place tonight, and, and you were to be knocked down and killed by a bus... Where would you spend eternity? Anyone heard those kind of questions? Okay. Now, as a teenager, these questions would terrify me. I used to think there was a demonic bus driver who was kind of, you know, coming on shift at the end of Christian meetings, ready to take a few Christians out. And and what I've discovered is that Jesus isn't selling tickets to heaven. Now, of course, now, don't misunderstand me. Eternity is really important. There is new creation coming, and we're going to be with him uh, for all of eternity and with his family. It's going to be brilliant. It's going to be amazing. But when Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I've come that you would have life and life in all its fullness, he wasn't just talking about pie in the sky when you die. He was talking about cake on a plate while you wait. Jesus is good news for us now, and he wants you to thrive now. That's why the Bible is laden with this rich word, shalom in the old testament in the greek irene and we say it means peace and it does mean peace but it really means thriving it means well-being and so the right commitment is are you taking care of yourself how are you doing on the states of shalom of us the whole of life so your physical well-being your emotional well-being your mental well-being your relational well-being on every level For some of us in this room this evening, like the best thing you can do for your life and faith is get a better night's sleep. It is not improving your prayer life. It is not reading the Bible. The best thing you can do in life and faith is sleep better or eat better or get some better, a bit of exercise or think about what you're reading or taking on board, you know, spending less time on Facebook and and more time feasting on other things. You know, the commitment to self-care, embracing shalom for yourself. It's like uh, my new spiritual director, Pete, he says to me that the good news has to be good news to you, and then it's good news through you. But it's got to be good news to you first. Like when you're on a flight, what do they say? When the oxygen mask comes down, what do they say? You put it on your face first so that you can then look after other people. And so it sometimes feels selfish, and I'm not saying self-care at the exclusion of anyone else, but in my experience, like people involved in Christian work are generally rubbish at self-care. And, uh, and I am learning to be better at this. Rhythms of life, you know, trying to take a day off. Um, by that, I mean doing different things and just embracing new stuff. Like, you know, I've discovered in the last year, I quite like cooking. Now, I'm not saying I'm a good cook, but, but, but what I found to be quite relaxing is when I'm chopping up veg and making a paella, which is my signature dish now, and uh, when I'm doing that, I've got a little bit of Ed Sheeran in the background, and, you know, I'm dancing along and, and listening to all that stuff. Like, I don't think about church. I don't think about urban saints. I don't think about any of those things. I just enjoy that moment. Like, I love movies. And I put it off for years and years, but three or four months ago, I bought a Cineworld card because I thought, if I buy this card, then I know that I, every week I'm committing to go to the cinema. And because I'm a bit of a saddo, I have a task that literally pops up on my schedule. It did today, saying, book cinema trip in the next seven days. Because I want to make sure, because I'm, when I know when I go, and I'm watching a movie and I'm enjoying a movie, I'm, I don't think about anything else. What are the things that give you life? What are the things that fill your tank up? Imagine your life is like a fish tank full of water and every time you give out, every time you serve, every time you work, work, every time you serve someone, it's like something is taken out of the tank. 
unless you replenish the tank, unless you put things in that are going to build you back up again, what you'll find is there'll come a day where something happens and you have a disproportionate reaction to it. You go really, really mad. You think, well, what was all that about? And the answer is your tank is empty. You're, you're scooping up the dregs. That's when people have nervous breakdowns because they've got well below the line. What are the things that bring you life and give, you, give those things? So right, uh, right uh, commitment, right people, right focus. And then the last thing is the right priority. The right priority. What is the most important thing of all that's going to help you keep on keeping on? And in Philippians 3, Paul talks about all of these accolades, all of this status stuff that he's got. You know, he's got this amazing job as an evangelist. You know, he's going to write most of the New Testament. But then he writes that. He says, I consider it all rubbish. In fact, he says a swear word, but I'm not going to say it because I don't want to offend you. But he, like, he's, he, he's so strong and like everything, it's rubbish. He said, the most important thing, the priority is I want to know Christ. I want to be close to him. That's my number one goal in life. Not to be known as a great evangelist, not to be known as someone who's writing this or writing that or going here or going there. I want to be known as a man who walks closely to Jesus. That's the ultimate goal. That's the most important thing. Remember that scene, some of you, in, in, uh, in the life of Jesus where he goes to have dinner with Mary and Martha. And uh, Martha has the gift of hospitality. and She's passionate about serving Jesus. She's making an amazing meal. Her motive is good. And Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to him. And Martha gets a little bit ticked and says to Jesus, come on, Jesus, like, you know, tell her to come and help with the sprouts. And, uh, and Mary goes, and, and Jesus goes, I'm not going to do that. Like Mary has cho chosen the right thing. And what has Mary chosen? Intimacy above activity. What I'm learning, and I say learning because I still find activity a lot easier than intimacy, that actually when we carve out time for closeness with Jesus, then he helps us ensure that the activity we're doing is the stuff that's going to bear fruit, the stuff that's really going to count. So healthy activity for the Lord is birthed in the place of intimacy. That's why you constantly see Jesus escaping to pray, because he doesn't want to be set by anyone else's agenda. He wants to come to the Father and say, what would you have me do today? God help all of us cultivate those habits. Special moments, whether you're an end of day or start of day person, but also the moments throughout the day where you can be aware that God is present with you wherever you are. The right commitment, the right priority, the right purpose, um, and the right, um, sorry, the right focus, and the right people. Four, four things that hopefully will help us keep on keeping on as we journey in faith. We've got about one minute left. Any question, comment before we finish? Great. We'll go forth and do it. It'll be amazing. All right. God bless you guys. Enjoy your final session.